Okay. Okay. Uh, so good morning. My name is Stefania Melillo. I am a researcher at CNR, where I am in charge for the experimental and tracking activities of COBS Lab, which is directed by Andrea Cavagna and Irene Giardino. And uh, in this talk, I will first introduce our experiment, and then I will present SPARTA, a spatiotemporal tracking algorithm that we developed in the last years to uh, track individuals in large and dense gro animal groups. The activities of our lab are focused on collecting data of bird flocks and insect swarms in their natural environment to retrieve the 3D trajectory of each individual in the, in the group. So first of all, uh, why is our experiment so hard? First, because uh, we want to reconstruct the 3D position of the birds. So it's, uh, we want to recover the X, Y, Z position of each individual, and this cannot be done uh, with only one camera. So we need a, a multi-camera system. Second, as you already saw yesterday in uh, Andrea and uh, Alexandra talks, uh, we are in the field. So uh, as you saw in these images, uh, we are on the roof of a building during winter in the cold to collect data of birds while we are against the sun in summer in several parts of Rome collecting data of midges. And uh, um, all, um, besides this uh, very uh, hard physical work, uh, the, the, having a um, um, performing experiment in the field means that every day we need to bring the equipment in the field, mount everything, collect the data, unmount everything, and go back home. So it's, it's quite hard, but uh, the real reason why the experiment is so hard is that accuracy on the 3D reconstruction is not for free. So, um, and it depends on two main factors, on the setup you choose of your cameras, so I'm, and, and in particular on the baseline between the cameras, and on the accuracy on the calibration of the system, which in particular um, is the accuracy on the measurement of the uh, mutual orientation of our cameras. Again, we are in the field, so we need to find uh, an easy way to measure the mutual position of our cameras that we can do every day, um, but being sure that our accuracy is high. So uh, our, for our experiment with birds, um, birds are 100 meters far from the cameras. We choose a baseline of 25 meters between the cameras, which means that we need to find roof where we can put our cameras so far. We need to bring with us cables 25 meters long. And uh, um, what we do is that uh, we fix the position of the cameras before the experiment starts. And then we wait that birds um, are in our field of view to collect the data. This can be very frustrating because sometimes you have uh, craziness happening on, your, on the side of your field of view, uh, like birds spelling the, your letters, your names, but you cannot move the cameras. You have only to wait uh, that, that, they will, that something will happen in uh, your field of view. And uh, to calibrate the system, we use a simple but very effective uh, method. We mount each camera on a bar with a gauge on each side, and we pull a fishing line from one side of the bar to the other side of the other camera here. Uh, we, we use this fishing line as a marker on the gauge to measure the position of the, um, of the cameras. And uh, uh, we test the, our accuracy performing 3D tests. So what we do is that we go to the roof of our building, we set up the cameras as we were in the, in the field, we put targets on the roof in front of our building, uh, we measure the distances between targets, we take pictures of these targets, we reconstruct their position, and uh, then we, we can, so that we can compare the estimated distances between the target with the real ones. And uh, uh, what we achieve is a very good result because we have an error which is below 1% on targets which are very far apart, and uh, uh, an error of one centimeter, below one centimeter in targets which are very close to each other, 
uh, of about, at a distance of about 20 centimeters, which is the body size of our birds. The situation with midges is quite easier uh, because the setup is much smaller. So uh, we, are, uh, we have midges eight meters apart from the cameras. The baseline is about six meters. And uh, what we can do here is that we can post calibrate the position of the camera. So we start the experiments chasing the swarm. We can move the cameras. And then as soon as we mm, start the acquisition, we will uh, stop to move the cameras and uh, we will take the data. And at the end of the day, we will take 50 pictures of these two targets here. We measure the distance between the targets. And uh, um, we use 30 of these pictures to fit the angles between the cameras, while the other 20 will be used as control targets. And even in this case, we have a very good result because our accuracy is uh, below 1%. Our errors are below 1%. Uh, in, both post, in both the targets that we use to fit the angles and the control ones. So, um, okay, let me show you some video. Uh, this is a movie of uh, our starling flocks that we take, we took in a um, termini station where birds are used to roost during winter. Uh, it's a flock of about 600 birds, and uh, as you can see from these pictures, uh, we lose all the details on the birds, which appear as small black dots over a light background, while, uh, why? Okay. This is a movie of, of a swarm that we collected in Parco degli Acquedotti. Here we use the backscatter of the sunlight on the images to have them appear as white dots over a dark background. In both cases, we are losing the details on the individuals, and this will make our um, tracking very hard because we cannot use any information on, on the in individuals. Uh, so, okay, there was written something, okay. Uh, so, the main issue of all 3D tracking methods is how to deal with optical occlusion, uh, which occurs every time that two objects are on the same optical line of one camera, so that they are the image is the same on the camera, and uh, in, when this happens, you completely lose the identity of the objects you're looking at. This is what happened in this case, where the blue and the green objects are, the blue and the green birds are separated at the beginning, now they are getting in an occlusion, and after that, they will be again separated, but even by eye, you cannot see, you cannot say who, who was who, who was the green and who was the, bl the blue bird. In the best case scenario, using two cameras, uh, you can use the other one to recover the identity. This happens when the two birds are separated in the 3D space, 3D space but only um, occluded only in the 2D space of one camera. As in this case here, where the upper video is the same as before, while in the bottom video you have the other camera where the two birds are always separated. So using the, the matching the information of the two cameras, you can recover the identities and overcome the occlusion. And most of the tracking algorithms are uh, designed to uh, solve these issues, while the worst case scenario is when the two, the two objects are in really 3D uh, proximity so that they are occluded in both cameras. So you will lose the identities in both the cameras, as in, in uh, this case here, where the blue and the green objects get occluded at the same time in both cameras. At this point, what happens is that the information of the two cameras are uh, useless, <laughs> or you cannot recover the identity from one camera or the other, and um, what can happen in the results of your tracking is that you switch the identity of, of, of your birds. Uh, our uh, new uh, tracking method, Sparta, is designed to solve this kind of occlusion, which are particularly hard, and uh, to do this, what we do is that we move from 3D body centers to 3D volumes. So, um, okay, what we do is this. We first detect the objects in, uh, in the images. 
but instead of, uh, we, we do not associate, associate to each object its 2D body center, but we consider the entire, all, all the pixels belonging to that objects. And uh, we match these pixels across the cameras. This is something that is uh, well known in other field of uh, tracking, not in collective behavior, not with these big objects. And okay, doing this, what happens is that um, we reconstruct the volume of the objects we are looking at. So we reconstruct a 3D cloud of points and uh, um, a okay, 3D cloud of points. So in the case of a 2D occlusion, or a simple occlusion as the one before, since we are working directly in the 3D space, we will have two separated, well-separated 3D clusters, the green and the blue, while when there is a 3D occlusion, what we have is a big cluster, but it's only one cluster, which is uh, much bigger than the other, than, uh, than the normal ones, because uh, it represents the volumes of two objects very close to each other. What we want to do now is to use dynamic information to split this volume in the two objects which are occluded. So we first um, perform a temporal linking. We use a point-to-point -point linking based on the velocity to define, uh, to associate the 3D clusters. And uh, we build a cluster graph, which is made of clusters link linked in time. Uh, at this point, we identify the connected components of this graph, which can be made of one-to-one -one connected clusters, as the one, uh, uh, the, the three on the left, or they can be, uh, they, they can, they, they can have like some some of, of these clusters can have can have multiple linking. Uh, so the the single the one-to-one -one, um, clusters represents single trajectories as the one uh, that we uh, obtain when we, um, for, for objects which are in a 2D occlusion, while uh, when we have objects in 3D occlusion, what happens is that the connected components with which they belong as a, this typical X shape with the center of the X, which is the occluded cluster. So um, what we do now is that we focus on few frames around the occlusion, we define, uh, we, we, okay, we switch back from clusters to point, we define an energy fun function H, which is the negative sum over i and j of w, i, j, x, i, x, j, where i and j are different points, x, i uh, is, denotes the cluster to which the point i belong, belongs, and w, i, J um, represent a coefficient which, which is associated to the pair IJ. WIJ, uh, this coefficient could be attractive if it is positive, because what it's doing is that it is decreasing the energy. So, okay, oh, so sorry. <laughs> okay, we want to uh, find the solution which minimizes this energy. So. The, uh, when the coefficient wij is positive, it will decrease the energy and will go in the direction that we want, while when wij will be negative, uh, it's what we call the repulsive link, and it will tend to increase the energy. So the crucial point is how to choose this wij uh, in a way that uh, the, the, the solution that we found, minimizing the energy, will uh, uh, split the X component in the, in the um, two different identities. Okay. So we define WIJ for uh, both from uh, static and uh, dynamic uh, points. So we define static coefficient WIJ between points I and J belonging to the same frame, while uh, the dynamic coefficient are referred to points which belong to two consecutive frames. And, um, okay, WIJ will be positive for those points who are at a distance, which are at a distance smaller than the average nearest neighbor distance between the points. What are we doing here is that we are uh, positively linking 
points which are very close to each other so that in uh, single clusters, we will, have, we will have single clusters highly connected and uh, um, we are defining wij with negative values when the points i and j are far from each other. So at a distance which is bigger than the average cluster size. What, we're, what are we doing here is that in a cluster which, is, which represents an occlusion, we will have blue, here the blue points are uh, attractive links, so these blue points here are points which are, in a, in a, attract, which are connected by attractive links, but we will also have points um, but, uh, but the points which are very far, far from each other will be uh, connected with repulsive link. The idea is this. In the, when we have the occlusion, we will have a bigger volume. So we want to split the, this volume in such a way that uh, the points belonging to the side of the object will be in a in different partition at the end. And uh, um, we... Okay, these negative links will be also useful to separate the clusters belonging to different branches of the X. So at the end, what we have is that at a, from, a statical, from a static point of view, we will have single clusters highly connected, highly and, con and positive connected. The occluded clusters with some repulsive link and uh, um, clusters belonging to the different branches connected with negative links. Now we use the dynamic coefficient to link to each other the clusters belonging to the same branch. And uh, what we want to do now is to cut these negative links here. Uh, okay, we want to cut it, minimizing the energy that we defined before, and it is exactly what happened. So um, after the, um, the solution, after the minimization of the energy, will give us the two different, uh, will give us the two different uh, connected components, the blue and the green one, uh, which corresponds to the two different identities that were occluded in the central cluster. Okay. Uh, we tested our, this method on, um, two different data sets published by Zheng Wu from Boston University of birds, of uh, bats going uh, out from a cave. And the two data sets are different in uh, the density of the flocks. And, uh, what we, and we evaluated the results comparing it, comparing the results of Sparta, Sparta with other three methods uh, in terms of MOTA, which is the uh, multiple object target accuracy, so which measure, measure the percentage of well-reconstructed points. And uh, we also um, evaluate the quality in terms of uh, identity switches. So what we see in these two data sets is that Sparta is giving us the highest value of MOTA in both the data sets uh, with a negligible number of uh, identity switches, which is second only to Greta which is actually the other method developed in uh, our group. And um, so we think that this is a very, a new approach. Uh, we still have to uh, improve it, uh, testing it on uh, more uh, other data and to, um, to make it better and, um, to make it better, but okay. <laughs> the, um, the, um, the method is still not published, but you can find uh, all the details on the, on the archive. This was um, developed with Leonardo Paisi, Andrea Cavagna, and Federico Ricci-Derzenghi. And okay, that's it. Thanks for the attention. <laughs>